So when the choir was uh, singing from the choir loft, I, I looked out and I said, wow, this is beautiful church. And then when the choir was singing just now, I looked out and said, wow, this is a beautiful roadhouse. <laughs> Two saxophone solos this morning. What is that? Before, before, the, before the choir heads off this morning, though, let us, let us take a moment to just say thank you. Thank you. Yesterday was our first ever community day of service. That makes this the service after the service. I had to get that joke in. <laughs> Yesterday, listen to this. Teams from our church went out into the community and together we cleaned and stocked the shelves of the IFC food pantry. Together we cleaned the kitchen at the SECU house where family members of those hospitalized at UNC can stay. Together we cleaned windows and did yard work for Charles House and at two other communities providing daytime care for adults. Together we sewed a gorgeous sunshine lap blanket for the residents of Charles House. And then we sewed up the extra blocks into a shawl for UNC Hospice. Together, we assembled 11 quilts for Habitat for Humanity. And together, we constructed three little free libraries to go up in the communities in which those Habitat homes have been built. I'm just getting started. <laughs> together, in partnership with Table, we packed bags with food for children in our community who are at risk of hunger. Together, we sent a team deep deep into the canyon behind our property to clean up trash in Jones Park. Together we sent a team to Booker Creek Trail to pull in vases as part of their community cleanup day. Together we sent a group of our finest musicians to go sing in two senior retirement communities. Together we sent a team to the Homestar Emergency Shelter for Women, where we offered childcare and shared meal. Together, we sent a team to the community farm at Penny Lane to make preparations for the planting season. Together, our children assembled 100 blessing bags with water bottles and snacks and personal care items to give out to folks on the street. And then our children painted 200 kindness rocks to hide somewhere where they might frighten someone's day. Together, we unfortunately had to postpone our project of planting and beautifying at El Centro until the ground dries out. But that'll be done when, when the ground dries out. <laughs> and together, we wrote to over 40 letters to legislators calling for our nation to enact moral immigration laws. Yesterday. Wow. Wow, friends, wow. What an amazing day, and that's without even mentioning the beignets and the red beans and rice and the king cake and the yu yu yukes and getting to find out what wild getup Mary Beth would be wearing. <laughs> what a day. All last week, as the leaders of the pledge drive were busy getting the details together, as we were busy assembling pledge packets, as we were checking the weather forecast and rechecking the weather forecast and crossing our fingers for a break in the rain. All last week, <coughs> as I went around, as we went about these tasks, I was mindful of just how blessed we are, just how blessed we are that a community day of service a Mardi Gras-themed party community day of service, no less, is what our congregation got to focus on and throw our hearts into. Because let me tell you, if you read the news, it was a dismal week for a lot of religious traditions this past week. It was a dismal week for a lot of religious traditions. The United Methodist denomination was all over the news this past week for the wrong reasons. This past week, a special church convention was held 
And the outcome of that special church convention was that the United Methodists passed an extremely exclusionary and extremely homophobic set of policies. Doubling down on the exclusion of lesbians and gays from leadership within the United Methodist churches and prohibiting United Methodist churches from blessing loving and committed relationships between two men or two women. It is a tremendously painful time for the progressive Methodists. And for gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, gender non-binary, and queer United Methodists, it's even harder. Many of those folks have worked for years and for decades to try to reform their denomination to give it the shape of greater inclusion. Last week I spent a lot of time thinking about a friend of mine, a friend I've invited to speak, to preach from my pulpits on multiple occasions. This friend grew up in the United Methodist Church, felt called to ministry, displayed the gifts of ministry in abundance, showed herself to be a scholar, an organizer, a community leader, and then was told by her denomination that there was no place for her in leadership if she was openly lesbian, and that she could stay in the closet and become a minister, or come out and not. Last week, I thought of gay and lesbian couples who were married in this sanctuary in the 1990s when we were the only church in town that would not only tolerate, but honor and celebrate their loving commitment. I pray for those who are hurting from the evils of exclusion and oppression, and I pray that they may have the strength to choose a path of holy heresy. Because here's the thing. This church, our church, was born out of denominational conflict. We were born out of a church split over to heed the Spirit's call to a more inclusive love. It was the 1940s, and Reverend Charles M. Jones experienced his call as a Christian his faith as calling on him to cross the racial divide in Chapel Hill. His faith was calling him to transgress against the social and religious segregation in this community. And those in the Presbyterian Church who opposed his vision of friendship and reconciliation got him brought up on heresy charges. The church split, and those who supported Jones's vision of ministry chose a path of holy heresy, integrity, boldness, and courage. That's why we're here. While it was an especially bad week for progressive United Methodists and for the entire denomination, that wasn't the only bad religious news. <coughs> stories of a conviction of a priest who had been a high-ranking official at the Vatican, conviction for sexual assault of a child, and another story about how the founding minister of one of America's first megachurches has left behind a legacy of misconduct and abuse of power. Closer to home, I know that there are Unitarian Universalist churches among our neighbors that are struggling with pain and broken trust. I mention all of this, the heartbreak, the pain of the progressive Methodists, the abuses of power that make the news, I mention these not to be smug, not to take shots. But I have to tell you, when I sat down to write the service after the service, I counted my lucky stars. Thank God I don't have to figure out what to say to my Methodist church this morning. I hope breaks for those ministers. We're going to try to figure out what to say. And I get to come here. And what I get to say is, wow, you guys rock. <laughs> Yesterday was a whole lot of fun. What spirit, what energy, what love, what beignets. <laughs> wow. It's an easy sermon to write. 
<laughs> this is pledge season, after all. This is the season when we ask everyone in the congregation to make a financial pledge for the coming year, to fund all of our operating expenses. And I want to say just a couple of things about the financial aspects of this church. The first thing I want to say is that I want to let you know that the leaders of this church, the board, make a lot of wise and mature decisions about the church's finances. I remember last spring, Brad Kasiba, who was sitting right there, he came to me with news that I didn't want to hear, which was that the Jones Building, the roof of the Jones Building was shot, needed to be fixed, and it was going to cost in the neighborhood of $25,000. But then he got to say the second sentence, which was, we have $25,000 sitting in our maintenance reserves, and we can do this project. We had that money there because the board had seen it fit to budget for things like these, knowing that roofs need to be replaced from time to time. So we paid the $25,000, fixed the roof, and tweaked our 10-year facilities plan. Here is what we did not have to do. We didn't have to come to you on Sunday morning and pass a hat for fixing the roof, just as we were about to kick off a capital campaign. We did not have to organize a series of fundraisers. And we didn't choose to deal with the issue by setting out buckets and hoping that it wouldn't rain. <laughs> Judging from the winter weather, Brad would be pretty mad with me if our strategy for the roof was to put it off for as long as we can. And it's your generosity, it's your generosity that's the engine that drives wise and responsible leadership. But I do want to throw out a challenge to you. Good work, but also a challenge. I've come to believe that for a church our size, for a church with our level of programming, for a church as active as we are, that we've been requiring, <coughs> insisting upon, and expecting a quantity and quality of work from our staff that's more than what we pay them. I believe that for a church our size, for a church with our level of programming, for a church as active and as vibrant as we are, we require and we insist upon and we expect the quantity and quality of work from our staff that's more than what we pay them. We're both understaffed and we don't pay them enough. And this is something I'd like to remedy as soon as possible. And I'll be talking with the leadership about this, but let me just say that this morning, the avenue for remedying this is the annual pledge drive, which lasts for the duration of this week. And so I want you to give with the depth of joy that yesterday made you feel. I want you to give as generously as the church requires for the quantity and quality of the ministry and programs it offers and for the quantity and quality of the ministry and programs you'd like it to offer. And if you can't give that generously, then give as generously as you can. Because something else came to me this week as I was planning this service. And I got that reading from Vanessa Sutherland. I chose it because I see if this is that piece of Eden. This is that piece of Eden. Which can be treated with neglect, which can be evidence of a church not fully rooted in the community, or can be as it is, a sign of love made manifest in the world. And that is what it is, that is what we are, a sign of love made manifest in the world. So help it. Help it to be what it is, a place of all sorts of unexpected blossomings. Help it to be what it is, a community that shines for the values we're proud to <coughs> proclaim. Help it to be what it is. Which it is in the wider community, a place that is well regarded. For the last couple of weeks, I've been teaching a class on Wednesday mornings at Carroll Woods. And the class is interesting. It's, it's half members of our congregation and half residents of Carroll Woods who are not members here. And there's, there's one person who's kind of in both camps. Um, and it was really interesting because at, at the first class, 
the two groups were sort of squaring off, like feeling each other out, like oh, I don't know you. And then, and then we got into it. We kicked. We uh, we, we we did really good work together. But after the class, I I was curious, and so one day I asked a couple of the residents what they know about our church. What do you know about community church? They know their friends go there and talk about how much they love it. This is interesting. They said they know that when they attend a memorial service here, that the memory of the person who has died will truly be blessed by a church service and by a caring community that rises to the occasion and truly honors the life of the individual. They know that powerful ministry will be done. And they also know that we are warm and welcoming. We're the type of church that includes rather than excludes people. Pretty good reputation. So help us be what we are. Help us be what it is, this piece of Eden. This piece of Eden with Mardi Gras beads and king cake. This piece of Eden with ukuleles and screen cleanups. This piece of Eden with meals to the shelter for women who've been abused and planting flowers at El Centro and singing in community centers. This piece of Eden is all of ours. Amen, hurrah, blessed be, and let us close this morning in song. Our closing hymn this morning is number 1018. We're going to have our band uh, get up and, uh, and play, and I invite you to sing out. <laughs>